Hello everyone, today we're tackling part 2 of our critique of the video Darwin's Biggest Problem, long story short, evolution. So let's jump right in. <laughs> In the last video, we saw the author repeat a number of arguments from ID proponent Stephen Meyer's book, Darwin's Doubt, regarding the Cameron explosion. Let's pick up where we left off. Philadelphia, 1966. A bunch of math nerds got together and they started rocking the evolutionary boat. We're talking big wigs like MIT's Murray Eden, Harvard's Ernst Mayer, Richard, Richie Rich Luantin, French mathematician Marcel Schutzenberger, and the one, the only, the Nobel laureate himself, Sir Peter Medawar. I have to cut this segment on the mathematical challenges in half because there are two huge issues with it. We'll get to the other in a second. So did this conference really rock the boat, as the author says? Well, let's ask biologist John L. Harper, quote, Most biologists are satisfied with a theory that can be tested and proves predictive. It is a different challenge to a theory that it should have an effective working model, for failure may imply either imperfection in the theory or imperfection in the model. It is doubtful whether this symposium has done much to influence the theory of evolution. It may have done much to improve future models." Close quote. Seems that the only boat it rocked was Stephen Myers because, of course, he wrote about it in Darwin's Doubt. There's no wiki page on the event, interestingly enough, but here's what we can glean of it online. It seems that the object of the symposium was primarily for mathematicians to be able to effectively model evolution in silico. The biologists, on the other hand, pointed out that this would be difficult unless the mathematicians were to account for many more biological phenomena that they hadn't accounted for in earlier programs. The point of the symposium, it seems, wasn't that there were any problems with the theory of evolution itself, but its computer modeling. Of course, evolutionary computer science didn't end with the symposium in 1966. More recent research has yielded great results. In 1996, Wagner and Altenberg pointed out Quote, the process of adaptation can proceed only to the extent that favorable mutations occur, and this depends on how genetic variation maps onto phenotypic variation. Biologists are not confronted by this problem because they study the end products of evolution, which are prima facie evidence that the favorable mutations have occurred at a sufficient rate. Furthermore, a biologist wanting to study this question faces great methodological hurdles. Comparative and experimental approaches to the problem are blocked because one cannot simply pick alternate genetic systems that produce the same phenotype and compare their capabilities to produce adaptive variation. In evolutionary computation, however, this is possible." Close quote. Okay, so you guys know this whole neo-Darwinian thing, it's not looking so hot right now. Animals need cells to function and do stuff, right? Right. And cells need little bits to do stuff, right? Yep. And those little bits need DNA to do stuff, right? Uh-huh. Well, maybe we should, I don't know calculate the chances of that sort of thing happening. And they did just that. The field of computer science had come on the scene and now that DNA was better understood, scientists were eager to see how easy or difficult it would be for the Darwinian mechanism to generate the information that DNA required to create new forms of life. Fossils or not, if the numbers showed that random mutation could make the simplest bits of life, then the biologists were confident that they've got a good shot at making the more complicated things. So these nerds did what they do best. They crunched the numbers and the results were tentative but they didn't look good for the biologists. The mutational mechanism, as presently imagined, could fall short by hundreds of orders of magnitude of producing in a mere four billion years even a single required gene. First, remember the problem wasn't neo-Darwinism, the problem was the models. The biologists were, and still are, entirely confident that evolution works. Second, Mormon Frank Salisbury was a creationist until at least the early 2000s. He died in 2015. Regardless, his quote, repeated in Meyer's book, comes from his 1969 paper, Natural Selection and the Complexity of the Gene, where he basically calculates the probability of DNA forming purely by chance, as well as the Earth's biodiversity, resulting by chance alone. John Maynard Smith refuted this argument just a year later, pointing out that Salisbury confused abiogenesis with evolution, and that Salisbury can't make such a judgment regarding abiogenesis. 
Of course, Salisbury's argument is a gross straw man of evolution and abiogenesis that we've picked apart in two different videos, creationist statistics and misunderstanding abiogenesis with the help of inspiring philosophy. The important point being neither evolution nor abiogenesis operate on chance alone. Many of the mechanisms that guide population genetics and organic chemistry are deterministic, not random. And Salisbury's own position involved too. In 2006, he wrote that, quote, the case for evolution is so strong that many aspects are now well established, close quote, while admitting of his 1970s views that he, quote, would take a much less favorable view of the creationist literature than I did then, but I would still point out some problems, close quote. Of course, it's 2019, and any claimed problems would have to be measured against the ever-expanding data set. They couldn't get the numbers to work for even the simplest building blocks of life, much less the whole animals that appeared in the Cambrian. While most scientists were still happy to accept Darwin's mechanism, skepticism was growing. After Wistar in the 1970s, young biologists could no longer ignore the geological record's lack of the expected pre-Cambrian fossils. In time, the science developed to more accurately measure the likelihood of whether or not the Neo-Darwinian mechanism could account for the Cambrian explosion. These experiments demonstrated that even on evolutionary deep time, the odds of random mutation and natural selection acting on DNA to make the animals in the Cambrian explosion were slim, to say the least. Early estimates pinned the odds at around 10 to the 90th to 10 to the 63rd. More precise, recent experimental results pinned the number at 10 to the 77th. That is one chance in 100,000 trillion. Trillion, trillion. Trillion, trillion. Trillion. For random mutation in natural selection to generate just one single protein, much less the millions in a typical cell. Even evolutionary deep time is far insufficient. The simplest self-reproducing organism is so insanely complex that the amount of time needed for Neo-Darwinianism to have a fighting chance vastly exceeds the most generous age of the entire universe. We're not talking rocky odds or mighty ducks odds. We're talking an elderly one-legged turtle in the Kentucky Derby kind of odds. So, first, none of those researchers, Yaki, Sauer, or Axe, were dealing at all with the Cambrian explosion. I don't know what to call this other than a complete misunderstanding. Each of their papers cited by Meyer pertain only to the probability of a functional protein fold. We explored this in creationist statistics. One paper in particular that we mentioned in that video was Exploring Fitness Landscapes by Directed Evolution from 2009, which cites Douglas Axe's paper that includes the 10 to the 77th number. The paper reviews several experiments of directed evolution of proteins in the lab and their results. One experiment in particular that was documented in a paper from 2007, researchers managed to evolve a recombinase that's able to remove HIV DNA from a host cell. So the 2009 paper concludes, quote, Despite the vast size of sequence space and the complex nature of protein function, the Darwinian algorithm of mutation and selection provides a powerful method to generate proteins with altered function. The simple uphill walk on a fitness landscape in sequence space works because proteins are wonderfully evolvable and can adapt to new conditions or even take on new functions with only a few mutations. In addition to providing useful proteins, directed evolution experiments have also taught us how proteins adapt and shed light on processes at work during natural evolution." Close quote. One chance in a hundred thousand trillion 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 trillion, huh? We've also talked in other videos about how mutations have indeed changed the function of functional proteins, as in the human apolipoprotein A1 Milano mutation, or the mutation in tetrodotoxin resistance in garter snakes. One might object and say that these cases are nothing new as they already started out with something. Well, that's not a valid objection since evolution always starts out with something. It's descent with modification, not descent from nothing. However, protein coding genes can form from non-coding sequences. So a completely new protein is coded by a gene that has a completely novel origin. These are known as de novo genes. In 2012, Carvunas et al. looked at open reading frames in non-genic regions in the genome of Saccharomyces, testing it for their model that new functional genes can evolve from transitory protogenes. They identified about 1,900 candidate protogenes among the open reading frames they detected, and that open reading frames form a continuum from non-gene to gene sequences. 
In March 2019, Zhang et al. looked at 13 closely related species of rice and identified a large number of recent de novo genes. They could actually determine the rate of new de novo genes being formed and retained. The rate they measured was 51.5 de novo genes per million years. And in some de novo genes, they could clearly see a stepwise formation of gene structure. So, regardless of how tiny that probability may be, it happens whether we like it or not. Second, none of their papers cited by Meyer had anything at all to do with natural selection. That's just false. Third, there's no evidence to substantiate his pronouncement about how long it would take to produce a simple living cell. So, moving on. So, evolutionary scientists today are more and more acknowledging that the Neo-Darwinian model has proven simply inadequate in providing an answer to the question of life. Well, yeah, we've moved far beyond what Neo-Darwinism originally was, so true, I guess. But let's get back to those quotes. The first was uttered by Stephen Jay Gould and says, quote, I have been reluctant to admit it since beguiling is often forever, but if Mayer's characterization of the synthetic theory is true, then that theory, as a general proposition, is effectively dead, despite its persistence as textbook orthodoxy, close quote. This quote comes from his 1979 paper, Is a New and General Theory of Evolution Emerging? Now, the question is understanding what Mayer's characterization was. It's this, that evolution is, by and large, just a gradual accumulation of mutations guided by natural selection that produces new species. This is certainly a part of evolution, however, it's not the only part, nor even the largest part. Gould doesn't at any point deny that evolution is true. His paper merely states that there are aspects of evolution, relatively controversial ones at the time, which are more important than most researchers had previously surmised, such as genetic drift, the majority of mutations being neutral, the founder effect, chromosomal speciation, and his own punctuated equilibrium. One might say that these concepts, along with others, did away with exclusive neo-Darwinism, but barring creationists, no biologists think these ideas did away with evolution. That's ridiculous. Due to the author equating evolution in general with a strict and outdated view of neo-Darwinism, which only includes Mendelian inheritance, phyletic gradualism, and natural selection, specifically, we can then chalk up the author's usage of this quote as Gould being skeptical of evolution as a quote mine. The Lynn Margulis quote is similarly a quote mine emphasizing pretty much the same idea as Gould's statement. Next, Jerry Fodor is a philosopher who has indeed published books and articles criticizing natural selection. His critiques haven't exactly inspired much change among biologists, as Jerry Coyne notes in his 2010 article, Worst Science Journalism of the Year, Darwin Completely Wrong Again. Fourth, zoologist Stanley Salth argued that natural selection being almost the sole driver of evolution was extremely problematic. But he did this in 2006, a time when pretty much nobody in the modern field of evolutionary biology held that position for a long time. They already had moved on to other important mechanisms alongside natural selection. Lastly, David Gelernter is an ID advocate who has both outright rejected evolution and praised Darwin's doubt. It's no surprise then why he landed on this list. So we have here two quote mind evolutionary biologists, a philosopher, a bizarre zoologist that didn't get the memo, and an ID advocate. We're still waiting to be impressed. The popular public-facing side of science does like to present a united front that all is well, but seeing so many problems mount and answers lacking, the Darwinian landscape has been broken up into a number of competing factions. And that brings us to today. These are all hotly debated and they do shore up some of the weaknesses of the standard model, but they all struggle to be viable for unique reasons of their own. This is a complete misrepresentation. None of these fields are vying with each other, nor are they suffering any critical difficulties. Neo-Darwinism, or more specifically natural selection and Mendelian inheritance, are still accepted today along with new additions to the theory like genetic drift, evo-devo, punctuated equilibrium, epigenetic inheritance, etc. They all work together to produce the modern synthesis, or extended synthesis, whatever you want to call it, Adding new information isn't a problem, it's a part of learning and it only makes the theory stronger. Scientists do indeed debate over evolution all the time, this also happens in every other field. But virtually no scientist is debating over whether evolution happens or not, only over specific details like which evolutionary mechanisms are relevant to particular instances. 
However, each and every one of them do explain a large set of phenomena, and they are all backed up by a scientific literature respectively. The only problem here is the author's inability to see the difference between a theory that is being updated with additional mechanisms and a theory that is, quote, broken up in competing factions. Darwin's biggest problem about his theory over 150 years ago hasn't been allayed by recent science, it's only been amplified. If it's so difficult to prove what these scientists want to believe, why do so many cling to their presuppositions? That's a great question for another video. As we saw in the last video, the Cambrian explosion was never Darwin's biggest dilemma, nor even a big dilemma for the scientific community. This is merely a case of cherry picking. And that bit about presuppositions is just projection. Just look at the statement of faith from any creationist website where they blatantly admit that their position stands entirely on a presuppositional belief system. So, in its summation, Stephen Meyer's attempted assault on the Cambrian explosion, and evolution generally, has been a whopping failure, as he ignores data and misrepresents sources at nearly every turn. And parroting his claims in a short video wouldn't make them much better, even if you add some nice animation to it. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.